Okay, what is going on everyone? I just wanna welcome you all to the new Science Applied series here on my channel. Um, and what I wanted to do with this series basically was borrow from all of the scientific information and the theory that I laid out in the Science Explained series um, and present that in a more applicable form so that you guys can take it and run with it in the gym right away. Um, so we're gonna be kicking off the series with a push workout. Um, so we're gonna be hitting the chest, shoulders, and triceps in this training session. Um, and if you're not familiar with a push-pull leg split, that would basically just look something like this. Um, so we're gonna get into it right away. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit more of a laid back style for me, um, but still, we're gonna get through everything. It's gonna be all very data-driven, and I'm really excited about this series. Um, so you guys can sit back, uh, relax, take it all in, and then let me know what you think if you get a chance to run the workout for yourself. Um, so let's dig right in with this push workout. Okay guys, so we're kicking it off with the bench press. And I think that if you are able to safely bench press, then you should. And I attribute a lot of my overall chest development to working up to a 370 pound paused bench press at 165 pounds body weight as an all time PR. And I've defended why I love the bench press in other videos, uh, but very quickly, uh, there are four main reasons why I really favor the bench press as a main movement for the chest. Um, so first and probably most importantly, uh, I think like almost any barbell compound movement, uh, it's very conducive to progressive overload. Um, so it's very easy to incrementally add weight or add reps over time with this exercise, which will continue to drive growth over time. Um, second, it, it really seems to be the case that guys with a big bench have big pecs. And this has been shown in the scientific literature as well. In 2014, Akagi and colleagues showed that one rep max strength on the bench press was very tightly correlated with pec major size. Now, of course, correlation doesn't imply causation, but when we combine this data with data from Ogasawara and colleagues, uh, which showed that even when the bench press was the only exercise included in the program, pec muscle thickness increased almost perfectly in tandem with bench press strength. I also think the bench press has the best carryover or transfer to other movements. And as I see it, if you have a very strong bench press, you'll also be much stronger on, say, the dumbbell press or the machine press, um, but it doesn't necessarily go the other way. I don't think just because you have, say, a really strong machine press, that doesn't mean you'll necessarily have a very strong bench press just because the latter is so much more technique driven. And finally, I really like the bench press because it activates just a ton of muscle mass. Uh, it doesn't only hit the chest, but also hits the delts and the triceps to quite large degrees. Um, and I think that makes it perfect as a sort of main heavy movement on a push day. Um, so in terms of execution, I like to set up the bench press with a pretty big powerlifting style arch, as you can see. And contrary to somewhat popular opinion, um, this isn't dangerous and it isn't cheating as long as your butt and your upper back stay planted on the bench and your feet stay planted on the floor. And I think that even from a purely bodybuilding perspective, using an arch like this is perfectly acceptable. And the main argument I hear against this idea is that it effectively turns it into a decline press, meaning it'll target the lower pecs too much, um, which is an idea supported by some EMG evidence. However, I think that the slight decline press, if anything, actually comes out on top as an overall pec builder. And this was shown in EMG data from Bohek, Bearhens, and Buskies, where the decline press activated more upper and lower musculature. Um, now, admittedly, they weren't using relative loading here, um, so it's perfectly likely that the decline only showed more activation because more loads were being used. Uh, but still, I think that's sort of the point. Um, overloading the pecs with heavier weights will lead to a greater tensile stimulus for growth. Um, and I think it's important to remember that there are no upper and lower chest muscles. There's only the pec. There's just different regions of that muscle. Uh, so as I see it for a main movement, um, a really important thing to consider is the question of how can we overload the muscle most effectively with heavy weight? And for those of you without any specific strength or powerlifting specific goals, I'd recommend going with a slightly more conservative arch. Um, so something like this, which will still allow for a safer shoulder position and allow you to get some leg drive and just move more weight overall. Uh, as for grip position, Bernetta Tal showed that for decline, flat, and incline presses, a narrow grip elicited more clavicular or upper pec activation. Um, so if your goal is to isolate the upper fibers, uh, a close grip bench is probably the way to go. Um, however, you wanna keep in mind that you won't be able to handle as much weight with a close grip press, um, potentially meaning less of a tensile stimulus on the pecs as a whole. And of course, you know, periodically you can 
vary your grip width and that would make a lot of practical sense. Um, so say doing something like heavyweight wide grip presses on one push day and then doing lightweight close grip presses on the other day uh, would be smart. As for tucking or not tucking your elbows, uh, I think it's really common for bodybuilders to flare their elbows out. It does make sense biomechanically to flare the elbows out more. Um, but I don't do, do an extreme flare uh, for a few reasons. First, I find that with the barbell, it tends to put my shoulder in more of a vulnerable position. Uh, and I'm able to move more weight with a slight tuck um, and more of a powerlifting style technique where you press up and back. Um, so I think that somewhere in the middle between an extreme tuck and an extreme flare is probably the best for both safety and effectiveness. Um, so here with the bench press, we're doing four sets of four to six reps with straight sets. Um, so that basically means the weight is kept the same across all sets and you're going to be leaving two to three reps in the tank, uh, so an RPE of seven or eight. And the goal will be to increase the reps until you get to the top end of that four to six rep zone for all four sets. And then you'll begin adding weight once you've maxed out the rep zone. Um, and it's a good idea to use a spotter if you can um, so that you're not scared to push yourself with heavier and heavier weights while maintaining a good form, of course. Okay, so up next is the incline cable fly. And here, unlike the bench press where we were trying to activate as much of the entire pec as we could, um, while also getting in you know, some shoulder work, and some triceps work. Um, here our goal is to isolate the chest as much as possible and focus in particular on activating the clavicular head or the upper pecs. Um, I think that for most people, an incline of roughly 45 degrees will optimize upper pec involvement. Um, and this was shown by Trebs and colleagues back in 2010, uh, where they found that a 44 degree angle was slightly better than higher or lower bench angles at activating the upper pecs. And because of the complaint that range of motion is gonna be limited with the arched bench press technique, uh, here we're going to compensate by extending the range of motion and going past where you'd normally stop and actually cross your hands over. Um, you'll find that this is really gonna shorten the pec fibers and you should feel a really strong contraction when doing these, especially in the, the medial or the inner part of your pecs. And here we're doing cables uh, because you just have a much more consistent tension on the pecs, uh, much more than you would say with a dumbbell where the circular resistance path is gonna cause peak tension uh, to occur at the bottom, which is great for stretching the pecs, um, but has virtually no tension at the top of the range of motion. Um, so for this exercise, I think under most circumstances, cables are the way to go. So up next is our first true proper shoulder movement. And like I've alluded to a few times already, uh, the horizontal bench press is actually very effective at activating the delts, especially the front delts. Um, however, as shown by Button and colleagues, a vertical shoulder press was the number one exercise out of the eight that they tested, including the bench press, um, for activating the front delts. And uh, not only that, the vertical shoulder press also significantly outperformed the flat bench press for lateral delts. Granted, isolation exercises tended to come out on top here, um, but we're gonna get to those next. Um, also in 2015, Sater back and Natal showed that out of the standing and seated barbell presses and the standing and seated dumbbell presses, the standing dumbbell press came out on top for side delt activation. And it also saw the most EMG activation for the anterior and posterior delts as well. Um, so even though I wouldn't necessarily say this variation is always better, uh, for one thing, you, you definitely won't be able to go as heavy, um, but given that we already have our heavy press for the day taken care of, with the bench press, I think it makes sense to go with a press that will optimize activation while increasing involvement of the side delts with this movement. And speaking of side delts, uh, up next was the Egyptian lateral raise. Um, so here we're leaning away into the direction of the raise, uh, which is based on some evidence from McMahon and colleagues uh, back in 1995, which suggested that the side deltoid becomes more involved as you near the top end of the range of motion, uh, whereas the rotator cuff tends to do more work near the bottom end of the range. Um, so by leaning away, you basically put the arm at about 15 to 30 degrees of abduction from the very beginning, uh, taking further emphasis away from the rotator cuff and onto the side delt. And doing these between the legs is actually pretty helpful uh, because it allows you to perform the motion almost entirely in the scapular plane, uh, meaning the line of pull will be directly in line with the orientation of the side delt fibers, uh, which puts them in an ideal lifting position uh, for generating maximum tension. Okay, so to round out all of the pushing muscles, we're gonna hit some triceps through some tricep isolation or some elbow extension work. And of course, both the, the bench press and the standing dumbbell press will target the triceps to a very large degree. 
Um, so I wouldn't say that assistance tricep work is required for progress or required for growth, um, but it does come very highly recommended when it comes to optimizing progress or optimizing growth. And I'll just defer to my Arm Science Explain video here uh, if you want some more detail. Um, but in short, I think you wanna structure your workouts where you'll have one exercise, like a press down, where your arms are more down at your sides, and this will target more of the lateral or the outside head. And you wanna have one movement where your arms are more up overhead uh, to target more of the long or the inner head of the triceps. And for this workout, you can just pick one of these two movements. And then in your other weekly push workout, uh, you can do the other one. Um, or if you find your triceps are, are really lagging, then you can do both of them in the same workout uh, just to get your triceps volume for the week a little bit higher. For these movements, we're doing four sets of 12 to 15 reps. And then finally, to finish things off, uh, we're gonna be doing two sets of a 60 second flat dumbbell hold using roughly 40% of your, your typical working weight, uh, say for a set of, of four to six. And this is a technique included in my chest hypertrophy program. But the basic idea here is to combine both a high degree of metabolic metabolic stress through the long set duration uh, with also a very high degree of stretch at the bottom uh, at the same time. And while experts disagree about uh, their respective roles in terms of hypertrophy, uh, I think that both stretch and stress uh, occupy some piece of, of the whole puzzle. And this movement also allows for a sort of novel means of applying progressive overload. Um, so rather than focusing on increasing the reps or increasing the weight, uh, here we're gonna be focusing on increasing time under tension uh, from week to week. Uh, so if in week one you do a 60 second hold, uh, the next week you'll try to add say five or 10 seconds with the same weight. And finally, to finish out the workout, uh, you can optionally add in three sets of 20 reps on face pulls. And while this wouldn't uh, strictly classify as a push movement, uh, I do like to include it um, just to help with some postural support and to prevent overdevelopment of the anterior musculature and just for a more balanced, I guess, upright, uh, symmetrical uh, of a look. And of course, you can always do this work on your pull days. Uh, however, I prefer to do it on my push days just to be a little bit more proactive and make sure that I'm making uh, my balancing out my push work with uh, sufficient pull work uh, a priority. All right, so guys, that's gonna wrap up the first episode of the Science Applied series. I hope you guys really liked it. Um, I decided for the viewers of this first episode, uh, I'd run a one-week sale on my chest and shoulder hypertrophy programs. Um, so those are two uh, push-focused programs uh, that you can run through. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend running them through both at the same time, uh, but you could say run the chest one for eight weeks and then the shoulder one uh, after that for another eight weeks. Um, so I'm gonna be putting these at 30% off uh, for the first week after this video goes live. Um, and if you wanna uh, get that 30% off discount, uh, just use the code science applied. Uh, so that's just all one word, science applied um, at checkout and you'll save 30%. And that basically will knock these programs down to uh, about 15 bucks each. Um, so if you're thinking about getting them, uh, now might be a good time to do so. Um, and that's gonna wrap this one up, guys. Uh, so thank you so much for watching. If you like the video, please leave me a thumbs up. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you happen to be new to the channel. And I will see you guys all here in the next video.